Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm Nicole Abade. I'm from Virginia Tech. I'm in the Department of Mathematics, but I'll, as a disclosure, the first disclosure I give you is my background is in engineering, but I've ended up in a mathematics department for reasons we can talk about over tea some other time. But, uh, but yeah, thank you so much for having me here. It's like so amazing. I arrived yesterday and it's so beautiful. Um, and so Luca told me that sometimes on Mondays, people talk about an open problem. This is an open problem for me, which is a data set that I have found to be kind of intractable in the way that I want to use it. I didn't know if people had other ideas about it. Um, so I don't know if many of you are here for the mathematics of movement semester. So hopefully this will be of interest to you. So yeah, as the title suggests, bat swarm data. I probably don't have to motivate this audience. That collective motion is interesting. Um, and so from my perspective, I feel like a lot of models of collective motion, the way that we think about it implicitly um, kind of builds in the human experience. And so in the context of echolocating bats, a lot of times when we think about how bats move in the world and how they sense their environment, it's hard to think outside of sensation that is dominated by vision. And so vision is what I call a type of passive sensing, meaning that there is an environmental signal and you bring it in. Um, and echolocation is what I call active, meaning that an agent will generate a signal that interacts with the environment and comes back. And so why this seems to me to be fundamentally different in the context of collective motion is that those signals can be intercepted. Um, and so it means that there can be other types of sensation beyond just the bat that makes the sound and hears its own echo, which is how we think when we like program robots, for example, like um, we do in engineering to use sonar. They use it analogously to vision. You make a sound, you hear something, the sound that bounces back, you use time of flight to say there's something X meters in front of me. But bats do more complex computations with this uh, th than this with the signals that they get. So we know that uh, the interference between the sounds that bats make um, and the echoes that they receive can be um, constructive or destructive. So either you can hear sounds that you didn't make, which is like extra information, or you can get confused between sounds that you make and someone else makes, which can be destructive. We call that jamming. Um, so the, the big idea is that there can be communication over these, um, these channels. So I have this kind of cartoon um, where bat A is flying and bat B is behind it, makes a sound, the sound bounces off it. So B actively senses bat A, but that A can also hear the sound if its ears can turn backwards, which most, most bats can. And so it knows that someone is behind it. So this would be a, the idea of passive sensing. And so from studies that I'll show you, it looks like both of these things are happening in groups of bats. Um, and so when I think about this from a modeling perspective, which is ultimately what I'd like to do, I think that these zonal models that we've used in our community um, may have to be tailored to situations like this, to situations where you have this type of complex sensing and communication relationship, or even just um, maybe more traditional things like pheromone trails, signals that are spatially located. So that I tell you a little Sorry, bit, I yeah. The email address, yeah. Red stop your emails. Can you just- Oh my gosh, it's the most fascinating thing. So they have a signal and ants, I found out recently have this too, in the minnows under their skin, there's a chemical that if the skin is broken, it becomes um, like diluted in the water. And if you put that chemical in the water, all the other minnows freak out because it means someone of their same species said the skin broken. So it means like fear substance in German. So this is this broadcast signal. And yet ants, I found if you like smush an ant of a type, it will release a pheromone that can make the other ants frightened. Yeah. Do you have a picture of a minnow? Oh, no, it's just a little fish. Um, a little tiny, like these little fish that swim together. Yeah. So yeah, definitely these animals that are prey animals and live in groups. There's like a reason to have these things, to know if someone is eating your type of animal. Um, but yeah, like different than the zonal, the kind of typical um, sensing and communication that those zonal models think of. Oh yeah, and please feel free to interrupt me. I thought this would be a discussion. I don't have an hour's worth of slides. So don't worry, I have like 25 slides. And I just tell you about bats. I don't know if people here have experience. I know Luca has experience because I've read your papers about bats. So I don't know if anyone else does. So um, yeah, please stop me if, if you have any questions. 
Um, let me tell you a little more about bats. So when I say bats, I mean echolocating bats. In case you don't know, bats are taxonomically in order. And the order is called Chiroptera, which means hand wing, which is so cool. So under that order, there are two suborders. So Mega Chiroptera means big bats, and that's like fruit bats. Almost all of those bats do not echolocate. Um, there's one species that does, but basically they use smell, they use vision, they have really good vision because like fruit's not going anywhere, right? And then microchiroptera, the little bats or micro bats are largely insectivorous, maybe nectivorous, um, and almost all of those bats do echolocate. So when I say bats, what I'm going to mean is echolocating micro bats, which is what you have here, what we have in North America. I don't think there's any fruit bats that are native to Europe but I'm not sure. Um, but most of the ones that you'll see here will be those small echolocating ones. So I'm really interested in those micro bats um, that use echolocation because they are this interesting confluence of sociality and active sensing. So they live in these very big social groups. Um, and a lot of the biggest colonies are what they call maternity colonies. So at least in North America, I'm not sure about Europe, um, we have these bats, that come together in the spring. The females all live in these large colonies. So they become impregnated in the fall, but they actually impregnate themselves in the spring. So they go to this big colony, it's all females, and they gestate, give birth, and raise their young together. The males like do something else. They just they call them bachelor colonies. They might just live alone in a tree, but the females all live together. And then in the fall, the females and the males come back together and they hibernate or migrate. Where I live, mostly they they hibernate. They find these hibernacula together, and that's in a different location where there's like suitable caves for them. So these really really big colonies that you may have seen these are the maternity colonies. And um, maybe I didn't write it here. The reason why they have to live in a colony when they're pregnant and they have their young is thermal pressure. So they might be ten grams, and so it's like a major energetic demand to have a baby. When before the babies are volant, before they can fly, they might leave them in the, the roost during the night when they go out to fly, but sometimes they fly carrying them, which is like a bananas thing to think about. Sometimes you see pictures and the baby is almost as large as the mother. So huge energetic demands. And so they have to, when they're roosting, snuggle up together. Otherwise they just get too cold. And so although they are social, they're not social in the way that I feel like I've thought about collective motion before I started looking at bats. It's not because they're like built to fly together. They may just fly together because they need to live together. The other thing that I'll mention is that they're incredibly long lived given their mass. Um, like in the wild, I mean, they can live, they live for years together. Some have been known to live for tens of years and it'll be the same females that go together and have their maternity colonies together and then hibernate together. So a lot of times individuals are genetically linked. Um, and so it's like they're, their buddies, it's their sisters and their cousins from year to year. So they have really strong social ties. Of course, every species is different, but this is kind of the large trends. Um, we know that when they fly in laboratory studies and a few wild animal studies that they have been known to use sound for collaboration. By that, I mean um, eavesdropping on the sounds that other bats make to find out something that benefits them, um, like where to forage for prey. Um, and this is maybe what I mentioned before, that sociality is not necessarily beneficial to their motion. It may be that echolocating and living in a colony of a million members is not great for flying together, but you do it because you want to live in this big group together. Um, it's like a big claim. But I think generally it's hard to say how interactions manifest during flight. So what I mean is when I studied fish, when fish interact, they have this like lateral line down the side of their body that helps them line up with each other. And when you say, oh, these fish are interacting, a lot of times it's a good proxy to say these fish line up. So even though you can't necessarily measure, are they looking at each other and thinking about each other and all this stuff, you just say, oh, they lined up. And that's what interaction looks like in fish. And that's because they're built to line up and we notice that they line up a lot. So with bats, they may align, that may be an interaction, but there may be other interactions. For example, what I'll show you here, uh, they may want to move away from other individuals because there's a lot of sounds that are confusing for them in terms of navigation. They may want to stay close to other individuals because maybe they want to eavesdrop on each other and see who's eating. So 
it's not immediately clear how the interactions manifest. I hope that makes sense. So that's what the reason that I wanted to turn to the data to try and do something data-driven before imposing a model on the system that we just don't know. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. They were all to echolocate them, such uh, interference, and uh, they just use sight. What, what do they do? How do they manage to come up? Do we know? There's microphones. I mean, some of these bats are not great. I've talked to bat biologists who say they use vision or they're just like memory. And then some people say like, no, they clearly have to use sound. They are making calls a lot of times in these big colonies. And the colony I'll show you data from is 10,000 members. So it's not little. Some people, there are some studies that say the flight muscles are linked to the diaphragm. So when they do a downstroke of their wings, it just makes a sound. It's like no harder to make a sound than to not make a sound. So some people could say when they're just flying and they're making sounds, it's not meaningful from a sensation point of view. It's very hard to test. <laughs> so we put novel obstacles in their course because that that is a huge question. Like. They make all this sound, are they using it? It'd be very challenging for like a human to build a system with this many. I mean, people have not tried some microphones outside of the entrance of the caves and some they've not tried. There are people who do that. I mean, we've done that. It's it's hard to interpret. The microphone data is like that that's sort of one of my open questions. The microphone data for more than two bats is such a nightmare. Um, so that is a thing that I'd like to think about. You know, there's a recent study by a professor who's at the University of New Hampshire, where she took a Harrier, you no, know, Harris's hawk, a hawk, a bird of prey, and put a microphone array on the back of the hawk and trained the hawk to fly through the bats at a private cave in Texas, some like cave that she's worked at. Um, her name's Laura Klepper. Her work's amazing. And so this work, I saw like an undergraduate published like a, a thing in like an undergrad journal kind of it. And I, there was a picture of a hawk with a micro ray on its back and a camera on its head. And I sent her an email. She said they hadn't published that work yet. But yeah, there's like people who are trying to do it. But the mic data, well, I'll show you the mic data, is problematic. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about how bats use sonar. Um, so when they fly together, they do lots of things. Um, it's clear from studies in a laboratory that they do understand when there's interference from the signal that they make and their peers make. And so that's jamming. So um, in this study, they had bats. I don't think we're flying, but I don't remember right now. So some of these studies, they fly and sometimes they don't. Sometimes in laboratory studies, they're on a platform and they play a sound at the bat like that the, the bat has made at the time when the bat is making the sound to see what it does. I think this is one of those. Um, and the bat can change the frequency. That's like choose a new channel, right? Someone's like talking to you in the same voice at the same time, you just change your voice. Um, there is the question that some of these studies are for stationary bats. And if they have evolved these techniques when they're flying, the stakes are a lot lower for them to like do an evolved behavior when they're just sitting on a platform anyway. But in any case, they're trained and that's an ethology question. They may also stop making sounds. This is a really nice study where the bats are flying. So it's two bats that are flying through a maze of chains, which is a typical laboratory setup for bats, which is so cool. It's like all these chains hanging down in a room. So it gives, it a, it gives them a really complex geometry to navigate. Um, and here they found that when two bats are flying together, they echolocate less on average but they still don't hit the chains. So the suggestion is that one bat is eavesdropping on the other bat. And so you don't have to make a sound, but you can still get information. Um, we know from a study where Luca is a co-author, also the, um, this type of eavesdropping happens for bats over longer distances. So in your study, I feel like embarrassed to say your study back to you. <laughs> These are bats who uh, kept a geometry where they could eavesdrop on each other over these long distances to hear the sounds that would be made that were canonical of feeding. And so it seemed like they were using information to find places where they could forage by eavesdropping on each other. 
Uh, and lastly, so the previous example was one of collaboration during, uh, via eavesdropping. In this study, this was uh, detrimental eavesdropping. So this is two bats who compete for hunting. And so if you haven't seen a spectrogram before, um, this is how we'll look at bat calls. And so it's a time frequency plot. So time's on the horizontal axis, frequency is on the vertical. Um, and the color indicates the intensity of sounds at a given frequency. And so this shows two bats. So this is one bat who is scanning an environment. So it's doing these frequency modulated um, like uh, sounds, like a swoop, like woo, woo, woo. And then don't look at this here. It increases um, the frequency. Let me say this. It decreases the interpulse interval. So it looks like it's going to get some prey. So they do this to get, I guess, a really accurate distance measurement on what they're about to eat. So between here and here, another bat comes in. This is a different bat who does these sinusoidally modulated sounds to jam this bat. So this is to confuse the bat who's about to eat. So it's a really complicated interaction. So that means that the uh, offensive bat hears the first bat and then understands how to change its sound to try and confuse it and get this. In this case, it was a moth tethered to a little string. So like they are definitely hearing each other and they're able to work with sound in a way that is incredibly complex. This was a study in the wild, which was amazing. And I met the person who was the author of it, which I was like so starstruck. I was like, how do you do that? He said, it took a long time because <laughs> they had to tether this moth near a bat colony and kind of wait for it to happen. So a big question that I have is, do bats perform collective sensing or motion? by eavesdropping on echolocation. Clearly from the previous studies, the answer is yes. But I'd like to go further than just saying this is happening and understand how it's happening in the context of this problem um, and the data set that I wanted to show you. So I thought I would tell you what we've tried. So we've tried to look at techniques from time series analysis to understand causal relationships between time series that describe the motion of the bats. And the reason for this is what I said earlier, that we don't know how the interactions might manifest. So if I just look for like alignment, I can do that, but I don't know that they're trying to align. And also it's hard to decouple any alignment from they're all flying in the same direction to, 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 to decouple alignment of like, you know, geometric constraints versus interactions. So we thought we would try this first. Um, so say I have these two time series, X and Y, I want to understand whether X drives Y or Y drives X. And then of course I have this big problem, which is another global signal drives them both. So that I'll try and take care of with statistics, but we've been using something called transfer entropy to measure these relationships. So transfer entropy is based on the information theoretic concept of Shannon entropy. And so Shannon entropy looked for uncertainty in a random variable. And in 2000, in this PRL paper, Schreiber extended it to say, instead of uh, random variables, imagine that you have time series. And so um, you wanna look at the uncertainty as you uh, share information between the time series or not, how the uncertainty changes. So this is the formula for Shannon entropy um, that you may be familiar with. Let me tell you about transfer entropy. So to be specific, X and Y are two time series. And for us, this will be something like a, a description of how the bats fly, like a trajectory. Um, so I'll have this over time. And so transfer entropy looks at, it, it, if a Shannon entropy measures the uncertainty in a signal, this looks at the reduction in uncertainty when I condition on previous states of both time series versus if I condition on only the previous state of one's time series. So if I imagine that X is the position of bat A, Y is the position of bat B. This says, what is the reduction of uncertainty of bat A at time M plus one, given that I know the positions of A and B at time N, minus if I just condition on bat A at time N. Right, the uh, quotient of the logs is really a minus of both of these. Um, and so if, y was totally independent of x, then this would just be, this um, guy could factor out of the probability. This would be the 
the numerator and the denominator would be the same, and so the log of one is zero. So if there's no information shared between these time series, it's zero. Um, and then if I have information sharing, then I get some positive number. And what's neat about it is that it's, uh, it is not symmetric in terms of X and Y. So I can look at information flow between Y and X and X and Y, and those could be different. And so uh, the idea is that we wanted to look at different spatial configurations that bats could be in. And so if I am in front of you, and you can't see me with your eyes that only look forward. And so spatial relationships plus this type of directional information flow is what we'll call it, should give us an idea about the types of sensation that would be used. To compute this, we have some parameters to set. Um, the first is the sample rate. If this is a one-step Markov chain, what's the right time step? Um, that's hard, uh, but something that you try too big and too small and find somewhere in the middle. Um, and in the same way, we have to build the PDF to get these distributions. Um, and so we use uh, an adaptive method that um, blows up places where you have dense data and kind of uh, de-emphasizes places where the data isn't dense. So this can be computed on multivariate time series. I just did scalar. And the reason that I'll show you is that our data is quite small. And so if I do multivariate, then I have like more dimensions to populate in this PDF, but it can be done. Here's an example of what the output of computing transcentropy would be. So we use this really nice toolbox called JIDT that was written by uh, a guy, Joseph Lizier, and it's really well documented, super easy to use. Um, so we have this parameter to build the PDF, which I'm showing here on the horizontal axis. You can think of it like bin width, if you were just using binning, even though we're doing something adaptive. So if the bins are too big and everything's in one bin, if the bin is too small, everyone's in its own bin, there's gotta be somewhere in the middle. And you could imagine, um, that same event for these types of, uh, these values of the parameter. So we're looking for some uh, consistency over a range of different parameter values. And then the transfer entropy comes out, it's dimensional. In this case, it's in bits. Um, so there is a meaning, but basically higher is more information and lower is less. So uh, on these left-hand plots, we have these two coupled logistic maps. And what you can see is that the coupling coefficient in this case is asymmetric, where X drives y much stronger than y drives x. And in this case, the coupling coefficients are the same. And so what we see here is so drive plus minus. Oh yeah, but influencing, I guess, is what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely not the sign. And that's like a hard thing here. Like it says there is a reduction in the uncertainty in predicting the next value, but it says nothing about in what direction or like in what way. Yes, you can see here the gap in transfer entropy is much bigger on the left plots. And this is in the direction of y being a driver, uh, oh, sorry, x being a driver of y. It's lower for y driving x. And in this case, they're both the same, not exactly the same, right? One is above the other. And so this is dimensional. So we have to find a way of understanding what's the background noise and what is actual signal. Um, so for what I'll show you going forward, we chose a parameter, I think we did five, you know, something that wasn't too big and wasn't too small uh, to do this nearest neighbor's estimation of the PDF. Can you, sorry, but yeah. can you put some for the error bar based on your choice of this yeah. uh, estimation? Can you actually create some error bars? <laughs> Does it make sense to have some error bars to be plot? Based, you, based on yeah. the procedure, not yes. per se, the error, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like some uncertainty. Some uncertainty. You could. Yeah, we don't, but I think you could. I mean... The reason you don't? Yeah. <laughs> is that because it's a lot of work or what? No. Yeah, because it largely looked like this, where it was like one was very much above the other. Yeah. We typically... Usually the results are pretty consistent until we've done stuff up until... 15 or 20 neighbors, but we could. Or maybe the values would be different, but they all shift in the same way. So yeah, we haven't, that's a really good point though. Because there's so many levels to this by the time you get to like the final number, you have to remember all the things you put in. Yeah. Let me tell you about the data. So um, we worked at a gray bat colony. In Bristol. Bristol, yeah. <laughs> I should, I did remember, I should remember you guys, yeah. Uh, when I said that, 
people, yeah, no, they exist. But even, well, I'm told people in the U.S. like, oh, I'm going to Bristol. Like, oh my God, really? I'm like, oh no, no, you must be thinking of the wrong one. It's a, it's actually interesting. So I live in Virginia, which is on the East Coast, and there's a state to the southwest of us called Tennessee, and this town, Bristol, straddles the border. So there's a Bristol, Tennessee, and a T Bristol, Virginia, and this bat colony straddles the state line. So this culvert is right on the state line. And when the bats come out, they come out either side. So they live in a culvert, which is like a tube to divert a stream under a road. And this is a maternity colony and they like it because the road gets nice and warm. And so the tunnel is warmer than you would expect. And then the bats come out every year, the State Department of like Wildlife basically does a survey. So Tennessee goes on one side and Virginia goes on the other to do their survey because they're different bats. It's Tennessee's bats or Virginia's bats, but it's all the same bats. Um, but it's neat. It's like 10,000 bats who live here. And it's like in the middle of a of a little city, you know, and usually when I've done work, it's like you have to like put all your equipment in your backpack and hike. And it's like a lot. This is like you drive the car up, you park right there and you're done. <laughs> Um, so they fly out in the evening. This is a creek. They fly upstream against the current and under this bridge that you can see here. And so we instrument this bridge with either thermal or infrared cameras and ultrasonic microarrays. We film them as they fly out. And so they fly out here and they go up to um, a river that's upstream, the Holston River, and they Good. eat there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. It's a really big colony. It's a big, I mean, do you have a picture of what you see there when you see during the day? Inside, they're they're tiny. I haven't been inside, but I guess they're like on the walls this they way. Sure. Yeah, they just like cling up in. It's that corrugated steel. Yeah. <laughs> it's warm. The road gets warm. The stream is not insanely warm, but the, the road gets warm. And so the bottom of the tunnel is just on the top of, like a, the top of the tunnel is like the bottom of the road. So it gets warm. What I did see, so when they do that survey, they cover the entire front. This culvert here is about 15 feet high. They cover it with a net and they put a harp trap. They make a little gap. They put this trap. So a harp <clears> trap <throat> is these um, nylon filaments. So it looks like a harp. Um, over a frame, like a steel frame, and on the bottom of it, there's a bag. So they fly and they hit the filaments and they slide down and they go in the bag. And so then they take them out of the bag and they put them in like a paper lunch sack and bring them up, like up to this, the top. And then the biologist, when they're doing this, they do this once a year. The biologist will measure the wings, assess the age, the sex, and then they release them by just throw them up in the air and they fly away. Um, what? No, they're too light. So tags are a major, we could avoid all of this if we could tag them. They're like seven grams. They're super, super light. And so you can tag them um, with passive tags under the skin, but then you have to have a passive tag reader for them. If you want to tag them with like a radio frequency tag, then you have to run around after them, which I read from your paper, you did. <laughs> You've got to run around triangulating where they are. Like the holy grail would be a super light GPS that could harvest energy from their flight. But that's, that, that's hard. Yeah. Because if you could put a GPS tag, like people put on their pigeon or something, you could revolutionize what people know about bats. Like these bats, they tag them and they know that they overwinter in different caves. They found them in like Ohio, in Tennessee, like all these places, they'll find bats that they tag with a ring on their arm. But how they get from their... It's not understood. Yeah, it's interesting. They can fly very far in a night. They're really fascinating. Like whenever when I moved to Virginia Tech, I had worked on fish and I started talking to a guy who worked on bats and the more bat papers I read, I was like, they're just amazing. Like very mysterious creatures. Here's what they look like. So this is a gray bat. They're just like this big. I don't know. <laughs> By comparison, you know, like honestly, every time I see it, they like all look the same. It looks so similar. There's one called the hoary bat, which the ends of the fur are kind of whitish, but the rest of them, I mean, they just look like bats, um, which is why I would love to take a biology class, but that's for later. This is the culvert. You can see the opening. So it's like a tube more underneath, but here it's these concrete sides. 
And here's what it looks like when we set up the equipment. These are thermal cameras. I'm going to show you data from mostly from infrared cameras. And then we have these microphone arrays. Um, this is how you can tell I'm not a real engineer. Everything's like PVC glued together and zip tied onto stuff. These are microphones. So there's four in each of these arrays. They point at the creek. And then um, from the time difference of arrival of sounds to these microphones, you can potentially triangulate the location of the sound source in three space. And then we have. Yeah. There's very little ultrasonic because we just filter everything that's below ultrasound. We've seen some weird ultrasound noise, which is like pulses. Yeah. This is what the thermal camera video looks like. So, so thermal cameras are expensive. So these, because we need multiple of them to get 3D trajectories, these sample at 30 hertz. So you can imagine there's a lot of motion blur. So in this, the um, white is hot and the black is cool. You can see these are, this is like a log and the bats kind of just fly as you're looking down over the stream and under the bridge where we're going. So I'll tell you what we've seen from this colony from data from 2019, and then I'll show you the data we have in 2022 that we're working with now. Um, we wanted to understand with pairs of bats. So break down the interaction to the atomic unit. Um, do they share information? So we tracked 20 pairs of bats. We talk about the front and the rear bat because they will always um, keep the relative orientation. So not where they change position. So 10 from the beginning of the night, 10 from the end. Um, and then we compute a uh, speed and curvature time series. So we're only working with scalar time series here. With those time series, we compute the transfer entropy, but we didn't have enough data points for each bat or each pair of bats to do it per pair. So we assembled all of the uh, speed or curvature time series to do an ensemble over all the bats that were tracked. So this is what the cartoon of what the data would look like. So I'd have the pair one, pair two, pair three, line up all those pairs, all of their um, their twins below, and then compute the transfer entropy in both directions. And then to build some sort of control condition to account for the fact that like they're flying in the same space, they can't fly through walls, they all want to go in the same direction, we permute the rear pairs. So um, match you up with someone who you weren't with in the same at the same time, but you were in the same place. And so this is the baseline for all the noise you would expect in the system. And so we did that 250 times to get a distribution of the control. We saw so, that, so yeah, so sure. When say pair, so when say pair one, so yeah. in, in the pair one, you take the front guy. Yeah. Pair one, three are, take the, the guy behind. Yes. So then you always have one individual. When you say pair, you always pick one individual. Right? So yes. Each of those blobs there is one individual. That's right. Okay, just oh, yeah. And I should also say, we took periods of time where you could only see two bats in the frame, which is not to say that there wasn't a bat that we couldn't see coming up behind who was influencing their motion. This is the best we could do because we don't want to capture them and make them do something in a laboratory. I wanted to look at naturalistic flight. Yeah, that was, yeah, it was hard to find these pairs, usually at the beginning of the night or the end of the night, where there would just be a couple that fly out. But it, yeah, it's, it's hard to say just these two. I mean, we did see, I won't show it here, we saw correlations and when they turn, so it looks like they're doing something together. Um, and we see that also with the transfer entropy. So here's what the data looks like. This is just choosing one <laughs> of those parameters to compute the transfer entropy. So it's the transfer entropy Either this is front to rear or rear to front, just with the subscripts. This is for all of the bats, the, beginning, the 10 at the beginning of the night, the 10 at the end. So the gray dots are those 250 different scrambles, the transfer entropy computed there, with the black bar showing the mean plus or minus one standard deviation. And the red star is the experimental data point. And so we see that, or we consider that when the red star is above one, more than one standard deviation above the mean of the controls, that we have significant information flow in that direction. So it looks like here that if I consider all of the pairs or just the pairs at the beginning of the night, I see significant information flow in both directions, front to rear and rear to front. We do. Yeah, it's definitely not above all of them, but hopefully it's whatever, even in the worst one, maybe 15 or 20. So it's in the 90th percentile. 
hi, hopefully higher than chance. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's definitely just not perfect. Um, but it looks like they're doing something more than just chance with how they fly together. Uh, but we don't see that for the 10 pairs at the end of the night. And I should say there could be motivations for bats to fly at the beginning of the night versus the end of the night. Um, like if you're hungry or you leave sooner, you may be more attuned to interactions with individuals. And also this data is from September, but as a maternity colony, the point at which you film them over the summer really indicates a, a different place in the life cycle. And so this is being filmed at a time when the mothers and the juveniles could be flying together. So that was the thing that we had hoped to look at. I'll show you data from August and September. We had hoped to do June, July, August, September to look at differences before and after the young could fly, but Sometimes people touch the cameras, they get moved. So we have we have two data points now. It looks like something is happening, I guess is what I take from here. Um, at the end of the night, it may be that that star is just above one standard deviation, not as strong of a, an interaction. When I look at the, oh, this is the speed time series, by the way. When I look at curvature, I see very different results. Maybe rear to front interaction and not front to rear, but only for the bats in the beginning of the night. So it's like not the strongest result. It's certainly not a consistent story, although these could be two independent behaviors, right? So speed means if I speed up, you speed up or slow down, and curvature is I turn, you turn. So there's nothing to say that these have to be the exact same story. But this, I was hoping that this would lead us to insights that we could then build into a model. I don't feel yet that these results are strong enough. And the other thing to say is we had to put all of the pairs of bats together. So maybe some pairs interact and some pairs don't. And we're losing a lot of signal by combining in this way, which is why I'm trying to think of other ways to look at this data pair-wise or group-wise. You may have noticed I didn't talk about the microphone data. So the microphone data. Just like oh, yes. So yeah. Perfect. Yeah. What Oh, so, because you said curvature means I follow and follow. No, because, you know, oh, turn. Way, one way of thinking about the response. But, yeah. So you just have a reference point, and then out of which you track two bats, and then you do the, the curvature. It's the, the curvature of the flight path. So, like one over the radius of curvature of the flight path. So it's like. So each point in space measure curvature. Yeah. And you see the other fellow has similar curvature. Yes. Yeah. And so, yeah, there, we don't look at a time delay. So it would the interaction that we could be looking at is like you turn and then I turn at the next time step, but it wouldn't be that you would see if there was particular a particular place in space where they turned. So if you were following someone and they went up and they turned when they got to here and then you turned when you got to there, this would not detect that. We'd have to scan through a bunch of time delays to do that. So I don't know if that's happening too. When we looked at correlations, the time delays we saw were really variable. And so while we did this, I think the next thing to do is to focus on analysis that can be done for just a pair of bats. Because like seeing these types of variable delays, there's no way to like put everything together. So we did this with these. It's, it's I, I want to do more. Yeah. So I'll show you what the mic data looks like for this. Uh, very small, less than a second snippet here. Uh, we see a number of calls, some calls, some echoes. Um, the student who worked with this uh, worked a long time trying to understand which were calls and which were echoes. Uh, you can certainly threshold for the power. You can see that these are kind of double calls and a lot of those are echoes off of the concrete um, that surrounds where the creek goes and the bats are flying up from. So, if we get a cartoon that looks like this, how do we say which bat makes which call? Uh, so when I bought this microphone array, uh, there were people who had done work tracking with this mic array. And I was like, oh, we're not gonna have to track with video. It's gonna be amazing. Uh, but it's like so hard. And so when I got in touch with them, which I should have done before I bought the micro array, they said, oh yeah, we hand identify which bat makes which calls, which is bananas. Like, you know, they have like multiple biologists who look and say, this call looks like this other call. It's like very, it doesn't scale, let's just say that. So for the pairs of that student who did her master's on this, identify what was like the, the spectral properties of one bat's voice versus another bat's voice. 
And she did that for all of her pairs, what she thought was the ground truth in the way that the biologist described doing it. And then did a k-means clustering algorithm on a bunch of spectral properties, the max frequency, the min frequency, where you get this, they call it like the knee or the elbow, all these different things. And then did a k-means clustering analysis of that. And because we wanted something objective and repeatable. Um, and so what we ended up with was a time series that was like zero if the best didn't make a call on that time chunk. And the time chunk could be only up to the frame rate of the camera, which was one over 30 seconds. And one if she thought a call made, a bat made a call in that chunk of time. Um, so it was not great. Not only that, well, it didn't change the results of any of, if we did a, a multivariate, a multivariate transfer entropy analysis using whatever trajectory variable we had and time, it didn't change anything since then, since we did this and also published this work. We found out that we may have had synchronization problems in that the microphone array, when it saved chunks of data, may have lost a little bit of time, which the person who we bought it from didn't acknowledge or wasn't aware of, but we saw after and showed it to them. And they were like, oh, well, so we've fixed that problem now. But now I have deep concerns that this data wasn't synchronized properly. And we were looking at calls from a different bat. Um, and so we published that in Frontiers. If you ever see that paper, I don't know whether to publish an errata or not, because I don't have the time to like investigate if it was right. I want to work on our better data. So that's an, a personal struggle. So this is just to say it's pretty complicated. Um, yeah. So what we saw, I think, is promising. It's not these consistent, like clean results, but it looks like there's some sort of information flow between the pairs of bats that fly together. And then the orientation of, then if I go back here, of these results, we see, we see what it looks like a uh, significant transfer entropy from rear to front uh, versus front to rear, or just front to rear. Um, and then here we see also some front to rear. So rear to front, let's see. Rear to front would be like the back bat echolocates on the front bat and then gets information. Um, sorry, that's not rear to front, that's front to rear, right? So if the front bat does something and the back bat sees it, information flows from front to rear. If I get information from rear to front, it's that the rear bat did something and the front bat responded to it. So this would suggest passive interaction in the bats. The fact that we see something above our level of significance, at least it doesn't preclude the idea that there is some relationship between the spatial orientation and the type of sensing that may be happening to lead to this interaction. Um, so yeah, we've done this. So I'm telling you about the gray bats. We did the same study with a species of, another species of myotis, these mouse-eared bats are all the same genus as the gray bats. Um, when I visited a colleague in China, so we did two other studies and we always saw this direction of information flow rear to front, sometimes with front to rear, um, and sometimes not. Uh, this is always just in pairs of bats. So it always in the same way when we've assembled the pairs together. So I, I feel like we've done as much as we can in this direction. So I would like to look at groups of bats all together and not just these isolated pairs where we assemble them. I would like to, I mean, either if we could do it per pair, but I think the data is so small we can't. But can I look at a group of bats that flows through an environment, like a control volume? Some come in, some come out. Um, and understand the information flow that's happening in the group as a, a dynamic process is the way I would like to look at it. So the experiment we did in 2022, we introduced novel obstacles into the environment and the wildlife biologist who helped me with the permit called it Operation Scary Pool Noodles. Do you know pool noodles, the foam noodles? So that's what you use as an optical, obstacle. So they're hanging there so the bats wouldn't get hurt. Um, we did this to make sure that we had something that the bats had to interact with because otherwise they could be using, uh, like, I don't know, they're, they have very limited vision, but some limited vision, they could be just remembering the environment. This was a new thing. Um, so you can see 80, the graduate student who did this work, who was really excellent standing here, um, setting up the pool noodles. And so we have what I'll show you, uh, data from two nights uh, in August and two nights in September where the bats fly first without the obstacles, then with the obstacles. So this was with, we took it with GoPro cameras that had been modified to accept infrared light. And you can see what it looks like here. So they definitely 
are interested in the obstacles and fly all around them. Um, and it's just, it's really cool. So we've had a team of undergraduates who have tracked these bats. Oh, can you tell what this is? This is, so we're looking down, the pool noodles hang, and that's the creek below. And the bats are flying towards us and then would go under where they end up going under here. So you have trajectories that look like this. This is a subset um, without obstacles and then with obstacles. Um, we started looking at statistics on these just to understand what's happening. Um, and so what I'm showing here is the average speed, the normal accelerations, so that's some quantification of the amount of turning and tangential acceleration, speeding up and slowing down. Um, and S, so S is bats who we observe flying alone, singletons, uh, with and without obstacles, SO is with obstacles, M is multiple bats, and then M MO. So singletons, we just got them where we could see bats flying alone in the frame, multiple bats where we took 10 second chunks, and that's where the majority of the analysis will be. Um, and so here is the mean of these values for one of the days, um, plus or minus one standard deviation. So what we see is that there is a significant decrease in both the speed and the normal acceleration when I compare the numerosity of the group. If I go from S to M or from SO to MO, these quantities go down, meaning that when you're flying with obstacles, you're flying less uh, quickly or turning less. So maybe less agile flight or more conservative flight. Um, and similarly for uh, tangential acceleration and speed, when I introduce, if I compare um, obstacles. So this is the, the first result is either going from one bat to multiple bats or going from a single uh, bat with without obstacles to with or multiple without and to with. And so the general trend, although it doesn't exist for all of these variables in all the cases, is that when you have more challenging flight conditions, you're just more conservative in how you fly, which suggests some sort of interaction, even if it's just like you treat other individuals like there are other obstacles. What suggests they're not doing that is that we looked at the uh, pairwise spacing of the bats. So uh, this is without obstacles, this is with. So on this axis, I'm plotting the distance just to the nearest neighbor. And on the vertical axis, it's the angle to the nearest neighbor. So uh, zero is right in front of you and pi is right behind you. There's no distinction between left and right. And so if I just look at the, you know, project onto the horizontal axis, we can see there's definitely a preferred nearest neighbor distance around a meter, a little more than a meter, with or without obstacles. It looks like when you introduce obstacles, it, the distance becomes a little bit bigger, which is again consistent with more conservative flight in the presence of peers, um, or sorry, in the presence of obstacles. And then with, uh, with and without obstacles, we do see a distribution that evidences a sort of staggered formation. So I guess I have words here to go with this. So bird flocks and fish schools show this. You don't follow directly behind someone. You like to place your nearest neighbors either at the like at the 45 degree points. Um, and so for fish, there's hydrodynamic effects. Also for birds, aerodynamic effects for doing this. But I mean, even just for sense, I can imagine this type of uh, formation. So would that do that? Like, does this facilitate eavesdropping? Why are they doing this? So are they trying to either mitigate acoustic interference, maybe they're trying to accomplish passive sonar, is this just about flight? We don't know. Like if I could hear the sounds that other bats make, if I can place myself in a certain way that I can hear their primary sound or echoes, I don't know, yeah. Um, we started looking at metrics of something that they may do better together. Um, when they're flying with obstacles, they certainly don't, um, uh, navigate any faster when they're in groups versus when they're alone because they move very circuitous routes. Um, we can't tell if they're avoiding collisions because they're very good flyers. They don't seem to fly with anything in any of the videos you've seen. Um, we did say, what if a bat is getting information from obstacles by eavesdropping on those obstacles in the same way that those um, laboratory studies showed them eavesdropping on each other for find, trying to find prey. And so we quantified exploring an obstacle if you got within a meter of it. And we saw that when you fly in groups, you do explore less obstacles on average. And so if it says, if we uh, assume that the bats know the same amount about the obstacle course, um, at least enough to navigate it when they're in groups as they are with singletons, then they may be doing some sort of 
collective navigation, some sort of collective sensing. Um, it's hard to say. So I can just tell you what I think of as the open questions. So I'd like to find the behaviors that interact, uh, uh, that evidence interaction. So doing this type of model free analysis as a classifier to then say these dots interact, these dots don't. And so what are the dots who interact? What do they look like? What does it look like they're doing that might be different? Um, and I like to infer the time varying network of interaction among these groups of bats they fly together to say this bat, this group is doing something and this group is doing another thing. There's independent groups, ideally. I would like to use the microphone data to solve what's called the cocktail party problem, which is ascribing certain sound to a certain bat. We have maybe between three and five calls per bat. So ways that someone who does data analysis would go about this, like training a neural network is infeasible for this type of data, but we do have it paired with the trajectories. And so I've been thinking about it as an optimization problem. So do sound source localization with microphones and then try and pair it with trajectories where we know bats are. Um, but it's been really hard to think about. Anyone has ideas, um, let me tell you what we have to work with. So we have two replicates of a two-minute experiment with no obstacles and obstacles. They were from August and September last year. And for each of those, we have at least three, sometimes four, 10 second intervals where we have three dimensional trajectories recorded at 60 Hertz and then separated by at least 20 seconds. So we wanted to have like replicates at the period of the night where there was a lot of bats flying out together. And for those same uh, intervals, we have data from an eight microphone array that was acquired at 150 kilohertz that can be looked at. Um, and then as a control condition, we have all of the singleton bats trajectories from all of those days too. Just to give you an idea of what it's like, let's see, do I have sound? Oh, maybe we're not hooked up to sound. Well, maybe you can hear it from my computer probably, right? So this is a video. I couldn't sync, I couldn't like get it to make a whole MATLAB video where it was all synchronized. So it's just in PowerPoint. Um, this is the 10 second video of the bats flying. This is a spectrogram over those 10 seconds. And so it's kind of hard to see up on the screen, but there's like a kind of intense period, a bit that's a relative lull, and then it gets more intense. Sorry. Yeah, I'll play it. So you can see it may be that it kind of lulls when there's few bats and they turn around. That's the lull. And then it kind of picks up. So not synced because I can tell <laughs> the audio stops later, but pretty cool. There's like so much in there. So if anyone has ideas, that is, that's all I have. So thanks. Yeah. You have to leave the room, man. So just- I'm so sorry. I did talk for it. <laughs> just, just, no, just a few questions. Yeah. Few questions. So, but then otherwise you can think about it. Uh, are you they thinking they are getting black? No. You mean to hide them from the bats? If they're using vision? No, that's a nice idea. To make them like invisible. Yes. Yes. Well, okay. So let me tell I'll tell you if you have any ideas. I'm going to be here. I'm sitting in M11. I'll be here until Thursday if you want to talk about stuff. But so I told you they were doing that survey, right? They put up a net that's called a mist net because it's very fine filaments. And I put the thermal camera in the creek and filmed what was happening behind the trap. And you can see it's 10,000 bats in there just waiting for the net to go. They just circle and circle and circle. Like I'm sure that they can see these obstacles without, if they were black or white or clear, they would have no problem. Because the amazing thing is you can tell who they catch in that harp trap. It's all the juveniles who are not good flyers. The adults are just like, Come on, take it now. Mm -mm. So they could be using vision, but like they definitely, if you put a, a net, they can, the ones who are good flyers won't get caught in that net. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.